I want to point out some design issues, some challenges with sensors design and uh, applications. Uh, for some sensors, you need to calibrate uh, to relate the measurement to physical uh, phenomena um, that can uh, you know, increase manufacturing cost. Um, you know, just one thing: if you use your compass in your uh, compass function in your um, smartphone, um, you know, from time to time you may find that the compass is not accurate. And so to solve the problem, you probably have to rotate your uh, smartphone for a few times and then, um, you know, just uh, um, get the um, sensors uh, recalibrated in that way. Um, also non-linearity. Um, some of the models we assume, for example, the uh, accelerometer model, we assume the string um, property and the damper property, they're all uh, constant. Uh, that might not be true um, for, you know, in situations, in certain situations. So that correction might be uh, required. And, and you know, uh, to address those problems, uh, digital feedbacks can be used to keep the operating point in linear region. Uh, we're going to talk about sampling and aliasing, um, you know, shortly. Uh, also, noise and uh, other um, challenges. Um, sensor calibration. Uh, we use a, a fine sensor model that captures the uh, sensitivity and bias. Um, and using this model, we can choose to, um, you know, um, fine tune or uh, calibrate uh, these uh, properties. Uh, we can uh, use this as an example. Uh, this is a, a accelerometer from analog devices. And uh, we can see that this is just a, a, a capture of the data sheet. Uh, there's, um, uh, let's see here. Um, you can see that um, the parameters listed here, including the um, measurement range of these uh, sensors. And, um, you know, for this is a three axis uh, accelerometer sensor. Uh, the measurement range is um, typically 3.6 G um, plus or minus because you have, you know, uh, opposite directions. Um, and there are, you know, alignment errors could be present. Um, package alignment error of plus minus one. Um, the uh, intra-axis alignment error of plus minus 0.1 degrees. Um, and um, um, zero G bias level um, also, um, you know, you, you, you will have um, voltage output from um, the um, from the um, the sensor to indicate the um, the readings at zero g uh, the typical uh, voltage output is one point five and the minimum is one point two maximum is one point eight um, and uh, so that's you know one thing you need to kind of uh, calibrate to um, to get a sense that uh, where is this zero g indicating so it, once you, um, once you um, measure that and uh, know that voltage, then you can start from that point to um, you know, measure the other, um, um, to put into use to measure the acceleration. So that's uh, one way to calibrate um, you know, using this um, bias value uh, that you uh, can refer to in the data sheet. Okay, aliasing is related to sampling. Uh, I will talk about sampling um, also when we discuss the analog to digital converter. 
So when you have uh, these sensors, um, oftentimes they produce a uh, voltage signal and uh, you know, many sensors, they are producing continuous voltage signal as output from the sensor. To process these signals, you will need to sample them uh, so that you can have these discrete values for uh, digital systems to, to process. Uh, that's called sampling. And uh, what we're showing here is uh, a phenomenon called aliasing. Um, sample data is vulnerable to aliasing, uh, which means that the high frequency components uh, masquerade as low frequency components. Okay, so let's look at uh, this uh, you know, diagram here. Uh, this is the time, uh, you know, so horizontal is the time axis. And the um, vertical y-axis is the amplitude of the signal. Uh, what we are seeing here, actually there are two signals. One is uh, 800, uh, I believe it's 800K. Check that quickly. I'm sorry. So the the higher frequency, this signal is at uh, nine kilohertz. Okay, and what's showing in the dotted line? This is another uh, signal, sinusoid signal. And the frequency of this signal is just one kilohertz. Okay, if you count the number of cycles, this actually nine cycles and versus this would be of the, uh, another uh, one cycle for the one uh, K Hertz. So again, this uh, solid line, solid curve, this is a nine kilohertz signal and the dotted line is one kilohertz signal. What we're doing here is that we are taking samples and the sampling rate is uh, 8,000 samples per second. Okay, so this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this uh, 0 0.001 second, uh, we're taking um, eight, nine, nine samples. If you look at this, um, black dot, this is the value we will get if we uh, sample at uh, 8,000 samples per second rate. And what we're showing here is all these dots, we have a, uh, these two signals overlap, right? This is, an, this is a nine K Hertz, this solid line, solid curve, and um, the dotted, um, uh, sinusoid wave is the 1k hertz. And all these samples, they overlap on the same dot for these two signals. Which means that by taking these samples, we have no idea what is the frequency of this signal. It could be that it's from 1k, it could be from 9k hertz. Um, now this is called aliasing. Um, and that's not good because you uh, essentially, we, we didn't get a whole picture of the signal. Uh, either of those, we didn't get a whole picture. Um, so we should really uh, be careful when we model the signal source and uh, uh, you know, getting um, these samples from these uh, analog signals. Um, even for digital signals, we also have a similar effect uh, where if you have in here example, we have two um, images and the sampled images also show uh, aliasing effect because you can see the patterns edges appear uh, as a the side effect. Uh, you will see this blurring and uh, images as opposed to a clear um, you know, image of what's you know, captured in the image sensor. Um, so that's the, you know, the concept of the aliasing. Uh, and we will um, talk about when we do the sampling using ADC, uh, how we need to um, 
decide the sampling frequency uh, to address this aliasing problem. Also, when we work with sensors, there can be noise and signals uh, uh, mixed with signals. Uh, we need to um, perform signal conditioning. And specifically, we want to use uh, filters uh, to um, try to eliminate or uh, minimize the impact of noise signals. In this example, uh, you have signal, uh, this XD, is mixed with uh, noise signals, uh, this XN. And, and because useful signals are typically narrow band, so we know the uh, at certain frequency, whereas the noise signals could be uh, wide band, uh, so it can be spread over certain frequency. Uh, using uh, low pass filters, uh, we can take advantage of this, uh, um, you know, these you know, filters to um, damping the, um, the uh, noise signal and try to, um, um, you know, enhance the impact, in, enhance the effect of the useful signals because the the way we really want to have a good signal uh, as opposed to the noise is to have, you know, the amplitude of the useful signal as high as possible, whereas the uh, amplitude of the um, noise signal as smaller as possible. Um, as a result, uh, we will be able to get this um, higher signal to noise ratio. So this SNR is very useful in all of the you know, signal processing domains, including sensor designs. Uh, we would like to uh, have the higher signal noise, signal to noise ratio, um, and that can be done using um, filtering. Um, sensors are physical devices, so they are subject to a malfunction faults. Um, they can uh, wear and tear. Uh, they may have uh, manufacturing defects. And so we cannot assume that all sensors on the system will work correctly at all times. Um, depends on your application. Um, if you, um, like in our second lab, if you design a, a game controller, um, you know, your sensors should work all the time, but you know, if it doesn't work, or it doesn't work for that second or a minute, that's probably fine. You can just give up the game and do something else. But if the sensor is um, um, on a critical mission, on say an airplane, then you have to be mindful how you can design a system to accommodate, to cope with such faults in sensors. A typical solution is to use redundancy. So you have multiple sensors to measure the same thing and try to get the readings from all these sensors and make a decision. Um, however, it, it you know, sounds um, good um, when you have multiple sensors, but you should also be careful how you use those sensors. Uh, in the slide, the um, Professor Lee and uh, Sisha you know, uh, outlined this example uh, this is a uh, Qantas Flight 72 um, that was uh, flying from Singapore to Perth on uh, the 7th of October 2008. This is an Airbus A330 uh, airplane. Uh, it started pitching violently. Uh, unrestrained passengers hit the ceiling. 12 serious injuries. Uh, it's a you know, big accident. Now, of course, you know, uh, in the recent um, several years, uh, Boeing had also issues with their airplane and caused actually, you know, plane you know, went down uh, in two occasions. And that's also related to sensors. Um, well, not necessarily sensors itself, but also control systems. Um, this is the um, case on the A330 uh, flight um, airplane um, in this flight, they had a few sensors, um, two, three sensors to be exact, the exact one on the left, two on the right uh, of the nose of the machine, uh, flight 
aircraft. And um, these sensors didn't uh, work uh, all the time. And, uh, and it may just happen that the sensor readings went too off. So the um, controller software tried to deal with these inaccuracies. Uh, but because it ignored the um, sensors readings, uh, you know, because it thinks one of the sensors didn't work, whereas the other one you know, didn't work well either. So uh, it actually, the controller used the wrong information from a um, malfunction sensor. And the uh, system actually caused um, the plane to uh, do violent pitching and then um, some um, you know, um, um, very serious um, troubles with the um, flying flight um, flying the airplane um, so you know, if you're interested there are a lot of um, details you can look up on the internet about this incident but the story is you know you, you have to be able to um, design your system to accommodate sensor failures. Uh, and that's not just the sensor itself or redundancy of sensors. Uh, you have to be uh, mindful about how your control software handles such uh, uh, unreliable sensors. Okay, so we uh, uh, went through these several points. Uh, now um, let's look at some examples of uh, actuators. Um, one of the most you know, widely used actuator is the motor. Uh, this is an example of a uh, you know, bionic uh, uh, hand. This is a bionic hand from um, Touch Bionics. Um, this was in 2007. Uh, of course, you know, nowadays you can find uh, many vendors of such uh, uh, robotic hand. But at that time, it had uh, five DC motors to control these fingers movement. Uh, these motors uh, were very precise and you know, controlled by the software. Uh, these fingers can be manipulated to grab a paper uh, without crashing it um, and or turn a key in a lock. And it's controlled by you no know, pulses of a user's arm combined with uh, autonomous ch control chip to adapt the shape of whatever it's grasping. Um, so this is a good example that show, shows how um, you know, actuators work. Actuators essentially to con uh, convert um, electronic um, signals or cyber signals into um, um, physical um, quantities. In this case is the, uh, the force, so grabbing an object. And there can be many other different actuators. Um, and this is just one of the, those many examples. Um, okay, so before I talk about this uh, pulse modulation, um, you know, because when we deal with cyber uh, systems, when we design our software to control the system, we all, you know, most of the time, you know, we do digital uh, processing. Um, we do the computation in terms of digits. And when we send out the controls, try to apply that to a physical quantity, we also use, um, you know, digital format. So it'll be hard that you will need to you know, um, apply a continuous uh, quantity. Let's say you want to move one thing, um, move the voltage uh, you know, um, continuously uh, from zero to five volts. Uh, oftentimes you have, um, you can output a zero, that means zero volt. And if you uh, output a one, it will be three volt if your VCC is three, or five volt if your VCC is five. So there's sudden jumps of these uh, digital output. And 
it's not that straightforward to uh, generate a precise continuous signal so that you can use to apply on some uh, physical uh, property or physical quality. Um, so that's why we say here, delivering power to actuators uh, can be challenging. Um, for some actuators, for example, uh, LED, you know, believe it or not, is an actuator because you are uh, applying power to this um, dial and it's emitting light uh, in certain colors. So it's an um, actuator. And you, you can turn this LED off. That means you can, you know, you can just output a zero and that'll be off, um, assuming that you um, connect the LED in a certain way. And you can turn this LED on. Um, you can output a five volt. So that's easy to do. But if you want to um, dim the LED and you want to be able to control the, you know, the uh, intensity of the LED continuously, and that's a different story. And that's not you know, easy to do without this um, pulse width modulation. Um, the pulse width modulation is um, a method to uh, effectively deliver power um, and change the power delivery uh, you know, uh, as you desire, in, you know, more like continuously. Um, using LED as an example, um, if you give it five volt, the LED will be the brightest. If you give it zero volt, it'll be the, you know, the dimmest or the darkest, it's off. Um, but if you want to give it effectively a um, 2.5 volt, then maybe somewhere in between. And you can, if you want to change the intensity of the LED, uh, you have to um, basically turn the LED on and off rapidly. Because if you turn the LED on and off rapidly, essentially you are delivering uh, not the full power, not the zero power, but some um, partial power to this device. Okay, and, and that's how this pulse width modulation is trying to do here. Imagine that this voltage is applied to a LED. Uh, so the um, full voltage is one volt and the lowest will be zero volt. And I can turn this voltage on for a shorter period of time and then shut it off. And then on um, for a short period of time and then turn it off. And I can make sure that I only turn the voltage to one volt at you know, one tenth of the cycle. If I can do that, that essentially to say, uh, I want you know, outputting roughly a, um, not exact 10 tenth, but uh, some portion of the power um, to, the, um, to the device. And this 10% is what we call duty cycle. Um, this kind of control is useful for uh, devices that can tolerate rapid on and off. LED is such an example. The other example is uh, the motor. So DC motor is actually another good example uh, that can tolerate rapid on and off. And motor itself has the coils on the, uh, running around the core and uh, if you apply a voltage, uh, you will have current in the coil. And when, when the coil is encapsulated into um, the case, which has a permanent or uh, electronic uh, magnet, um, then the coil will start to change if you apply the voltage. And also the, co the coil has uh, its inductance. That's kind of you know, a, the opposite, trying to slow um, slow the um, movement down because of the magnetic field. So when you apply on and off control to this motor, uh, the motor will uh, start turn, but you know, even if you um, turn it off, you will start, will still have the momentum 
uh, until you drive it next time using the next uh, PWM pulse. So in this way, the motor can control, uh, can turn continuously. So what I explained earlier is that this PWM uh, pulse width modulation, yeah, as illustrated here, is a good approach to um, power the actuators. And it's particularly useful for devices that can tolerate rapid and on and off controls. And this way we can deliver the power uh, to control these actuators uh, uh, efficiently. So this is what I was describing about the motor. Um, electrically, we can uh, model this device as such. Um, so the uh, V is the turning speed of this uh, uh, coil, uh, running around the core of the motor. And R is the resistance of the coil. And IT is the current at this moment. And L is the inductance of this uh, coil. And this uh, DI over DT, this is the um, changes on the current. And this K subscript B is the so-called the back electromagnetic force constant. Uh, that's you know, due to the um, um, due to the coil when you change, when you turn the coil actually, because it's inside the magnetic field, so it's actually generating the opposite current, like a generator. Uh, so that's the, the, the effect of the um, back electromagnetic force. Um, from the mechanical side, uh, this model uh, follows the Newton's law. Uh, so the, it has the it's movement inertia, is the, uh, come up, uh, will be, um, equal to the uh, torque and friction and uh, the load. So it has the uh, mechanic, uh, um, mechanical model uh, and follow this uh, kind of principle. Okay, so what we have talked about so far um, are the sensors and uh, mostly sensors. And we did talk about uh, briefly about actuators. We explained uh, from the model perspective how a accelerometer work um, and uh, we briefly you know, discussed about the models, uh, the bias and uh, um, you know, uh, other properties. And uh, we talk about the faults that you can encounter in sensors, which are physical devices. And uh, so that's what we um, have discussed so far.